Hello and welcome to Dinesh Guarda YouTube podcast series in partnership with citiesabc.com and openbusinesscouncil.org. We are here once again to continue profiling some of the people changing the world, the technology ecosystem, and as well our society with projects that are shifting the way we look at things, looking at innovation, looking at the, the best ways to approach change, but as well to create uh, sustainable innovation and sustainable development. In this series, we've been always trying to highlight cutting edge solutions, and especially the people, the, the kind of clusters or as well the inspiration people that are trying to find better ways to take forward uh, everything we're doing in society. And of course, as someone that is very uh, focused in the areas of innovation related with technology, the old transformation, and blockchain and artificial intelligence. Um, one of the areas that I want to highlight is precisely how blockchain technologies 360s changes society. And that brings us to our uh, special guest, uh, Christoph Zaknun, the CEO and co-founder of DAO Maker. So uh, Christoph yeah. is, uh, thank you and welcome to our series. So um, in terms of uh, looking at the profile of Christoph uh, is quite out of the box in the sense that uh, is the co-founder and chief executive officer of the DAO Maker, a blockchain uh, launchpad and the pioneer organized decentralized ecosystem that efficiently leverage human capital. Anything related to DAOs is cutting edge and we're going to be talking about that because it's something that uh, there's a lot of hype, but there's a lot of unknown and a lot of myths and a lot of as well issues. So um, Christophe is a doctor in medicine and holding a bachelor degree in robotics. And he has uh, had a diverse experience, uh, starting as an assistant neurological at trauma in children in the hospital of Austrian city Salzburg. And uh, he then moved to the Austrian armed forces as part of the Australian forces disaster relief unit. And uh, which is an interesting background for someone in technology, but it shows as well his human and technological as well as scientific side. And Christopher entered in the crypto and private business sphere in 2018, when he co-founded the TGE Alpha Corp and the DAO Maker. In 2019, he became the CEO of the DAO Maker, a position he still holds and is levering, uh, leveraging and taking the project forward. As the head of the DAO Maker, he has been overseeing this blockchain launchpad part uh, project and all the parties related. The DAO Maker is a growth technologies provider that creates software as a service solutions for nascent and growing crypto startups. And uh, its flagship product is the DAO Pad, a multi investment platform that allow DAO tokens holders to participate in early stage se token sales for stringently vetted upcoming projects. So this is going to be a, a quite technical interview we're going to try to define these topics and um, I'm looking forward to talk about this because it's an area that is really cutting edge in everything, blockchain and technology. So welcome to our series, Christophe, and I'm looking forward to talk with you. So let's start with, um, first of all, your background. So as a doctor, that's quite a, an interesting and very powerful position still for humanity. And you shift from a doctor to the Army Relief Unit to moving to crypto and private business. So can you tell us a bit about your history and uh, sure. how this happened? So actually it was the army was before, thank you actually by the way, before we start, thank you for having me on the show. But the army was actually before the doctor. So actually the army is very standard. Every Austrians have mandatory army. It's actually one of the three countries remaining in the world that has mandatory army, which is very surprising to people because Austria is like this country in the middle of Europe. Um, so that's very standard and People can choose to have a longer education if they choose to stay there for one year compared to having quite a boring time for six months. I don't want to get too much into that. However, it helped me very much be disciplined and follow orders. You know, you have to learn how to follow orders to give orders. And I do believe actually looking back that the army was one of the more important parts of my education. Uh, medicine is, you know, standard. I come from a medical family. My, my, both my parents are doctors and I quit medicine actually in the fifth year. So I was about to become a doctor, but I was working in hospitals for a long time. And I quit medicine a year before I finished, which at the time seemed to a lot of people very crazy because I got so much entitled and, and interested in crypto. It was, I started joining crypto early 2017 and saw most of the first bull run in 2017, 
which was complete insane time for a lot of people. You know, even 2021 was not as crazy as 2017. And I certainly love the idea of ICO and public funding because most of innovations is owned by VCs, which creates a power centralization point around the entire world, never been before. Like when we look at how people use, like kings used to own a whole country, at this point, most of the traffic is owned in Silicon Valley. Like majority of human interactions are centralized in the wealth of one, not even one city, it's like one valley. And with ICOs, we've seen, okay, of course, a lot of scams, that's how it hurt, but the technology by itself to allow people to participate in voting, which then later on involved into DAOs was revolutionary. So I decided to go all in on that process. And I believe that everything will be rebuilt on blockchain as blockchain is a better system than a share registry for equity. So in the future, most startups will be run on a blockchain system via token system. So me and my partner decided if every startup has to be rebuilt in token, then we should position ourselves as a company which helps the startups to rebuild the whole world. And since 2017, we've been dominating the space and by now are number one, uh, probably globally. So, so let's go a bit more to your Austrian background, because of course, normally Austria is probably not the country that you would say we would see leading such an advanced project in blockchain as the DAO maker. And uh, as well, most of the people probably don't know about Austrian uh, crypto, even the crypto uh, innovation that is there. And I know I met a couple of people there. There's quite a lot of stuff happening. Of course, this is not so much about that. It's about you and the DAO maker, but a bit of the, uh, um, about the education, about how do you get how did you get into the crypto first? Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's always interesting because a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of myths around the crypto. There's the the people the the get rich schemes. There's the there's all the people that have, that have the wow. These people made this money, and of course, there's a lot of. Uh, influencers in YouTube here that are normally trying to show off the, the millions that they got or actually the fake millions they got. But I think in the end of the day, it's about people like you and me working every day to create technology solutions that work and sometimes don't work, but we have to make it work and as well creating innovation. So a bit of your background, how did you start getting mostly to this and a bit of context of Austria? Sure. So um, while I was in medicine the fifth year, um, I spent some time researching a lot of things in early 17 and found a lot of information about Bitcoin maximalism. Early 17, there was no crypto, right? There was no ICOs. Crypto got invented mid 17. There was just Bitcoin at the time. And there was Bitcoin cash specifically. There was like some forks of Bitcoin. Um, and I just learned a lot from the Bitcoin maxis who are very warning about a lot of economic crashes in 2021 and 2022. And I thought, okay, if all of these things will happen, which they predicted COVID and all of these things, then maybe I should diversify my medical degree into crypto because if you can pass medicine, you can learn anything because you, you learn how to learn, you learn how to study. So I studied everything about Bitcoin and I bought Bitcoin cash on the first day, I think about like a thousand dollars and Bitcoin cash did like six X on the next day. And that was the first money I made because it was a poor medical student. And I thought, okay, I'm pretty good at this. You know, <laughs> obviously, it was just dumb luck looking back at it. But turning $6,000 in a day was a good experience. And then I got addicted to learning everything about it. And there wasn't much resources around crypto, especially ICOs. So I kept learning and learning. And that was really the, the founding moment of what is now known as token metrics. You know, the ways to, to structure these startups, that was not even invented at the time. And I was part of the people who co-invented the theory behind investing into ICOs. And then I shared my knowledge on Twitter, became an influencer, and then built a company to help people. Oh, that's that's impressive. And, and I, I like that part because it's really important. So so touch about the Austria. You didn't touch that part. I would like to... I know that it's so not Austria, about sure. location. Um, yeah. there's, Austria, I was just... Um, I mean, I have not much to do with Austria. I moved to, to Czech Republic for my degree. The company here is based in Czech Republic mostly, although we have three offices. So it's about 50 people. Now, the only relationship to Austria is actually, I guess, my passport. Um, and we have a few employees in Austria. Otherwise, we are very much based in Czech Republic. I think we're the biggest crypto company in Czech Republic and probably one of the bigger ones in all of Europe. Crypto in Europe is relatively unknown, like un- underdeveloped. 
And did you have uh, some challenges when you set up the companies there? Because one of the things is that when people set up specialties these companies, and I think it's important for people listening to us because there's a lot, of, really a lot of problems when people look at this. It's, it's really, I think, I would say 90% of the media and the noise is about quick get rich schemes and people forget the technology because if you look at this, uh, for example, I was looking today, even me, I wanted to take a course. And for instance, the, the top universities in the world are having big, big departments on blockchain technology. So it's from Oxford to, to uh, Stanford to all these universities. So this is a very serious technological environment that you have to do a lot of research like you did to get it where we are and people forget that. Uh, and I would suggest people listen to us, please forget the quick rich schemes. Of course you can make a lot of money here, but you can lose a lot of money as well. So please just, I want to always to it's make a, a legal disclaimer on that. But I would like to hear, especially how did you, uh, especially keeping base there, because normally all the crypto probably is based right now moving to Dubai or to, to uh, Dubai. a lot of other places. I would like yes. to hear, because it's great sure. that he's in Europe as well. I'm in London sure, sure. and I know that even London doesn't have any regulatory really solid part on crypto, which is ridiculous. And the US is struggling as well with some exceptions. So. Good. So um, a lot of people move into Dubai because the DMCC and the free market enterprise is easy to set up crypto shops. But if this would be like just public information for people, I would not advise to it. Because although they want crypto people, it uh, could be considered difficult for them later on. And there's certain risks associated to it. Um, that's one reason. Now in Prague specifically, Prague is quite crypto friendly. It's one of the most crypto adopted, Bitcoin adopted cities in, the, in, in Europe maybe even in the world. I think we have like an eight crypto, a Bitcoin ATM um, every two kilometers. I think there's two of them within like five minutes walking from me. Um, so that helps a lot. Within taxes, it's a fully European regulation and it's 15% flat for any crypto payments. So that's another reason why we set up here. Um, regulations within crypto is also easy. So we have a just a basic standard company even within your Czech Republic for employees in Czech Republic. And then most people set up an offshore company for hiring international. Crypto is international payments and it's international global workforce. So having an offshore company for hirees around the world and freelancers is probably the way to go. Yeah, that's very, yeah, it's it completely right. And I think it's, it's important for, for everyone to consider these things. So, so let's go right now about the DAO maker. So what is the DAO maker? How did you start it? and tell us how it works because i think really just thinking about the dao decentralized autonomous organizations it started actually i was involved with the first dao which is funny and i saw stress that it could, yes um i actually i was my I, did, I was involved in my first ico started in 2016 but it was launched like you said in 2017 uh and uh yeah, that's a lot of stuff that happens since that. But I would like, let's focus on, on the organization yeah. which you've been building a strong uh, profile and international footprint as well. Thank you. So we're the second DAO and the, the ticker DAO hasn't been used since the DAO in 2016. And the two things are quite similar, but in reverse. Let's start this way. So for most people who think, what is a DAO? A DAO is con should be considered as a structure to make proposals and vote on them using smart contracts. That's what a DAO should be. There's not many examples of actual DAOs. Most people use Snapshot, which is a system to use on-chain data to make signatures. But end of the day, there's still somebody acting on it. So if you want to go with the uh, maximalistic aspect of a DAO, the process of what a DAO can do has to be purely on-chain. Otherwise, it can't be a, a maximalist DAO. That's one way of seeing it. A different way of seeing it is just using tokens as a use of voting to propose things and have somebody that you trust act upon these things. So we elect our government and we hope that they will actually do what we vote on, right? We, they, we, they are still in control. We do have some kind of re recourse. So that's the second way. These are the two aspects of a DAO. Now, DAO Maker started off as a company which in 2018 built software as a service to turn any token into a governance model. But nowadays it's very, is you use, a lot of people use snapshots. We were one of the earliest um, creators of a governance plugin. Our governance plugin was used by a lot of nowadays very big companies like Avalanche, Elrond, Harmony, a bunch of layer ones. 
and was considered very successful. Um, it was way before its time. It was um, early, mid 2018 for community building when people didn't even know about governance. And because it was before its time, it probably didn't do very well. Nowadays, there's other services. But because we had a product that made DAOs, we called ourselves DAO Maker. Now, a few years later, we said, okay, now we should be working towards building DAOs. So cryptocurrency startups should go towards a direction of DAO because the token holder should eventually be taken on the project. And we are the number one launchpad and incubator in crypto. Maybe someone could say that there's also CoinList and DAO Maker and probably number one and two. So CoinList being number one, we're number two, specializing on different things. Um, we specialize on small stuff, while well, their stuff is on infrastructure, but that's the name, right? We help creating these startups, which are tokenized, considered as DAOs. But additionally, we are now moving towards a structure in which the company can act as a decentralized venture fund. And that means there's a certain amount of money that is managed, just like in the DAO that you were part of, and the people will eventually vote on it. But because we have extensive experience being one of the first people to ever create any governance plugins for DAOs, we have quite a lot of experience on how DAOs can be, go wrong. It's a very, very slow process. You, know, you first have to build the infrastructure and give the power back to the people step by step. You, know, you cannot build Rome as a democracy. It has to be built, centralized, and then have to be given back to the people. That's amazing. And I, I definitely your platform, like I said, is a leading platform. And uh, we can see actually for people listening to us, I suggest that you go to DAOMaker.com and you check the different uh, projects being listed, all the different things in the platform. And it shows you have projects that raise $4 million, others less and so forth. But in the end of the day, it's a marketplace for raising funding for platforms and for tokens. So so can you go a bit more, let's say that we have an audience that is very blockchain advanced like you and me we are <laughs> a bit far ahead to say less but there's a lot of people that don't really understand how this works so let's let's try to democratize a bit the knowledge because i think i always try to do that in this uh chris last week we had the we had the andrea bonacetto that actually first did the first nfts with the robot and they actually sold one million nfts with the robot with the sophia the robot and it's a uh, someone i really admire so let, let's go just to understand as well because i think when people speak about crypto it's always about scams always about the yes. negative stuff okay and if so we, let's if go the thousands of jobs that have been in millions of jobs that have been created and companies that raise projects that are funding a lot of developers universities and so forth so let, let's go through that kind of a narrative the narrative so is a simple important. simple process here now most people know kickstarter or gofundme so let's start with the things that people know in the traditional world. It's called the Web2 world. DAOMaker is a crypto-focused GoFundMe Kickstarter process. Now, unlike Kickstarter and GoFundMe, which is either charity, essentially giving money to things that you like in exchange for some merchandise, or nowadays private equity, DAOMaker focuses on tokens. The reason we focus on tokens is because there has been less than 1% of all private equity, like less than 1% of the companies, the startups on these very well-known um, platforms ever were profitable. Meaning if any user uses these platforms, there's a 99% chance that you will lose all your money, probably even higher. And this is not the case in crypto. Crypto, we are quite good at selecting these companies. We're essentially like the stamp of approval. So if we do a screening process, we try to make sure that um, there's a layer between the scammers and the retail users. And this layer is us. We have about 10, maybe even more companies applying every week to us. And we let maybe 5% pass. And this is essentially a stamp of approval. And due to the stamp of approval, majority of our companies, I think only 5% ever failed with many of them highly profitable. And that makes us very interesting for the newcomers. That's the most simplest word. If we take it a little bit more advanced, then it comes to not just finding quality companies, but like you said, it's a marketplace. We provide software because blockchain is a transparent database and our software uses this database to identify if a retail investor is a good fit for that startup. So if this is a gaming startup and there's a lot of transactions from this user playing games, then he is more likely to be able to invest in that project. So we match good companies with good small people. 
and thereby removing the need for venture capitalism. And that goes back to how we started the whole conversation, our mission statement to try to divert, to bring the value of the startups back to the people, the users. Yeah, and I think it's amazing what you guys are doing. I think this is very important for people l listening to us to demystify a lot of this use, but as well to the opportunities that are open with this. Because in the end of the day, this is, like you said, I think Kickstarter for the people listening to us, which is still not as big as should be. In the end of the day, is a way of finding funding for your projects, finding funding for your projects, as long as you do it right, of course, because in order to be listed here, you have to be very diligent and everything has to be registered in the code. So that means if your project is fake, it will be very difficult to get it there. And even if the project fails, there's an entire track record. And I think that's a, a big thing that is missing when all the criticism that exists around these things, but as well, very few compliments. Of course, there's, the compliments is the success, okay? The success of the industry speaks for itself. And of course, if it wouldn't be so successful, probably wouldn't be so much crazy people trying to get there and get a quick win. So like you said, like in Kickstarter, if I go to the DAO maker, I can actually fundraise to a company, to a project. I can actually stake a DAO. And this is the part I would like for you to, to teach how it works, because there's a lot, I have a lot of people from high profile, big companies to corporations, to governments asking me, okay, I don't get anything. And I'm not talking about DAO, I'm talking about very basic stuff. So I think it's important. And then of course you as well have uh, NFTs coming soon. And as well, you have a hub that is uh, about the DAO army. So could you tell us about, especially, uh, I think the fundraising is straightforward, but probably the stake now is a bit more complex. Okay. So I'd like to explain that. So in um, analogies to Web2, let's say you have a platform which has a freemium account and a premium account. Let's say you have um, Netflix. There's some, like Netflix is only premium, but there are some streaming providers that allow you to watch shows in free, but you have to pay to watch extra shows. And to upgrade to this premium account, you have to buy and stake these tokens. This is essentially, so the buying and staking is the same as a monthly subscription in crypto, in most cases. These two things analogies to each other. Now, we want if you want to get all the benefits of our platform, our utility token DAO, our requirement is you have to buy and stake a certain amount of tokens. If you have these tokens, and depending how many you have, you can unlock them different types of startups specifically for you and have a very guaranteed probability of winning. Every startup that we have, or majority of them, has like the, the premium version, which is only to the people who have done the staking and buying, and the free version. And the free version is what I said before, where we match people with the right wallet addresses if we see that they have the correct transactions to the startup. So obviously it's much more difficult to get into the startups, which are usually very profitable. And you have to have the right um, wallet profile. You have to be the right person for the startup, or you can just become a premium member of Dowmaker and have a um, portion of the size for the fundraise specifically for you. That's amazing. You summarize it very well. So that's good because it's, it's not easy to do this. So, so let's go back right now, if you would mind, I would like to touch a bit about uh, the importance of DAOs uh, in society and um, uh, why I think all big trends right now is about DAOs, for instance, when it comes to finance, big brands are getting into DeFi, decentralized finance. And of course the DAO will be a key element because in the end of the day, it's not different, like you said, from a crowdfunding platform. It's just using smart contracts, code and so forth. But I would like to touch, and, and of course you know a lot about this, um, understanding how you see the DAO technology and the DAO concept. And it's not just the technology. It's in the end of the day, this is a tech. In the end of the day, it's a social network based on code and based on smart contracts that has as well an entire business model around that. So if you could elaborate a bit on that, I would appreciate because it's something that I see that you are a great explainer, explaining as well uh, at these things. So a DAO is, stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So the decentralized aspect Okay, let's just go, what does that mean? Decentralized Autonomous Organization. It means people around the world coming together to decide how they want to be moving forward as a society. The DAO is just a democracy as a company. That's probably the easiest way. So nowadays we don't have any, every, democ every major company we have, say Facebook or YouTube, etc. Facebook has more users than the EU 
in not just one country. Facebook has more users than the biggest country in the world. Yet it is a full authoritarian dictatorship, right? And as a society and technology, as a society, we went to a technology that created um, a platform where most people spend most of their time on, which are completely authoritarian. And that's just how we ended up. And as a result, a lot of problems happened. And over the last 10 years, this discussion became more obvious. And nowadays, there's a lot of talk about Elon Musk buying Twitter to at least making an open source which means, okay, they still have full control of what we see and how we engage, but at least we understand what they do. At the moment, it's the situation where we have no control as a society of Twitter. I spend a lot of time on Twitter, at least two or an hour a day. It's more time than I spend in Prague where I live. I have no control and I have no idea what they're doing. There's complete, um, there's no transparency at all, whatever. And DAOs try to solve this problem. That was the idea to rebuild the startups, the Facebooks of the future in a way that are, they are built as democracies and not dictatorships. So I think this is a key element of the innovation around the concept of DAOs. And DAOs can be used for anything, for universities, for research, for academic, and for a lot of different things. And, and the, I think coming back to the DAO maker, because like you said, it's the second biggest platform in the world. I say for crowdfunding projects related with smart city, smart contracts, and especially in, in terms of uh, innovation around blockchain. So can you tell us a bit about some of the benchmarks and some of the, um, the findings that you did through the work of leading such a platform? And as well, some of the most interesting projects that came through the platform. So as we speak, I think there's around 30 or 50 projects that we can see immediately in the home page. And I'm sure you can talk about a lot of other things. Yeah, we, we did 120 in 2021. The collective um, value market cap of all the companies that we have raised is uh, north of $4 billion. So within the top 50, we have collaborated and worked with at least 15% of them. So our footprint within the industry is quite significant. So that we select, we do quite a lot of um, sales. But more importantly, the ones we choose become quite big over time. And this allows us to have a good amount of advisors later on that tell us, okay, what's the trends? What is interesting at the moment? What is the innovation? Um, the thing about crypto is it's very unclear we are, where we're going as a society. Crypto is still very much in the overhyped space with not much usage of the technology. I think we're most things in crypto are still Ponzi schemes or get rich quick, as you said. They are focused on gambling, so the most basic nature of humanity. Um, I think that's where the internet used to be when 80 to 85% of the internet, maybe even more, was just porn. So porn is essentially like the basic instinct of humanity and just as gambling, you know, addictions. And during this period of time when there was only porn on the internet, it was very difficult to know where the internet is going to. Like what will be the main use cases of the internet? So as a company, we believe that technology like blockchain is very good used for startups like these share registries for financial docu um, financial documentations, which is um, DeFi. Um, creating essentially everything that is now obviously the Bitcoin narrative, which is like essentially resistance, is at the core of it, and then things where you have disputes. That's the most important thing. Where you, some, somewhere where you should never have a dispute, that's really important, like the value of money, you should never be disputing that. That is a good use case for blockchain. And a good, anywhere where it's important to not get disputed, to have a transparent agreement, that's where blockchain technology is useful. No, completely. And then I think this is really amazing. Uh, the way I think the way you first of all congratulations for billion dollars is substantial amounts and i think it's important to see as well the money that is going through platforms like yours which is i would say at the level of a lot of banks don't actually raise that money <laughs> so so i think it's really impressive and i think it shows as well the robustness of your project and projects like yours and as well the potential of business so so like you said there's a lot of confidence here and this is a moving target so from, from a perspective of uh, the goals that you have for the organization, what are your goals? Because you are, of course, taking the project and the project. And as well, although we're going through kind of a 
crypto winter, which sometimes is good for people to come back to Earth. Um, uh, what what are your kind of views in terms of first of all the the future of the project and the maturity of the industry related? So our goal, like as a company, we are two things. So people see the launchpad, the Kickstarter, considered as the top of the iceberg. Um, maybe people know Y Combinator. It's the most famous incubator. They've done Netflix, they've done Uber, they've done I think Coinbase. They've done very many big, big companies. And an incubator is essentially a group of people who mentor, train, help, support companies um, on a larger scale than venture capital. Now, Downmaker is predominantly an incubator. So we have about 65 people working at Downmaker. Only five people work at the Launchpad. Our job is and our goal is always to become better at mentoring and training future startup founders because there's a lot of things that um, are very important in crypto besides the technology. And these things are repetitive. And these things are the 90% of the reasons why most founders fail. Now, our goal is to make sure that these repetitive things, these 90% of the reasons why founders fail are alleviated so that they can focus on pushing the technology forward and making the world a better place. That's the prime objective, to always become a better incubator to train our people, train our consultants. The second objective is to improve our technology and our user base to be able to connect investors, the right retail users to the right companies. If we would have a significantly bigger user base, then we have more users to choose from. So if I see that this per if this person has a 80, 90% higher chance of using a game and I can identify this because it's a public database, then the game will have a significantly higher chance of being successful because it already has the user base, which is the hardest part nowadays. By building tech is easy, getting users is extremely difficult. These are our two main goals as a company. Yeah, and I think in the end of the day, you are already as well an affiliate network at the marketplace that has a community, a very dynamic community of investors or, or at least uh, token buyers and token sellers and as well um, the people that are actually coming and engaging on this. So let me ask you probably a sensitive question, but that's uh, as, you, as you wish. So how do you look at the regulatory and compliance parts of this? Because I know that uh, you guys have been doing things by the book, but it's just important to understand the procedures. Let's say if I want to... To get into this and i'm sure there's a lot of people um everyone actually in some ways has some kind of crypto but normally i think the average at least the studies there's i think 300 million people that are more or less active on twitter on twitter on crypto more or less uh, and i think the numbers mostly double from 2021 to 2022 and if you look at the beginning of the internet like you said i think probably will be if you double now it might go to 600 million this year depends of or of this but it will be like uh, at a certain point there's a there's a, a exponential growth a leverage. But uh, I think from, from your experience, and I think what you guys have been doing is quite impressive, but as well, it has a huge component of uh, legal setup, compliance, KIC, and so forth. How, how will you tackle this and just top level? Of course, you don't need to go to technical for our audience. Um, if you go on our website, actually, Downmaker, you see on the front page a um, company called Astro Protocol. I think you, you've been on the website just during the call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Astro Protocol is um, one of the leading companies for regulation in the US. Actually, the ex chief of staff of the US is part of the team. You know, it, it doesn't get much more legitimate than the, you know, you can get the chief of staff, you can get Biden, maybe not. So we work with companies which try to create regulatory frameworks and protocols in the US. Um, we are also trying to work with the FCA to create, to program, um, proactively try to create regulations for fundraising. Um, that's one important thing. Now, the re crypto regulation is still mm, non-existent. It will come out in the next one year. As a company, it's more important to, to ensure not to engage in any money laundry or terrorist funding. So that's KYC and CTA. So counter-terrorist funding is very important. Um, there are many, many service providers for KYC and customing. So it was always very important to us and having a good structure, legally speaking. In the next six months, I'm mean, the last thing I'm going to say, there will be specific um, regulations around lounge pads. And we're working with these people to be essentially regulated from day one. I think majority of the issue is going to be more on, on DeFi, you know, which it's manages billions of dollars transactions. 
No, that's that's impressive, and thank you for for tackling this question. Very simple, and I think, of course, uh, for people listening to us, and probably our team will put some some graphics. You just go to the website, and everything is disclosed because you cannot start without going through this. But I think you explain it in a very way. So, so I want to go, and we we get close to the first uh, to the to an hour. So, so a couple of questions related to the industry at large. So, the the innovation around around the DAO is still really in the first stage, um, and of course, like you said. We're talking about five years, uh, so it's, there's no miracles in five years. If you look at most of the technologies, take at least one decade to become mature and to take to the next level. But I would like to hear mostly in terms of uh, the different areas of business that you are that you're seeing, and as well the maturity of the technology. How you see, let's say, the next two three years um, in terms of DAO technology, and as well the related ecosystem of blockchain and the crypto. So let's let's go tackle this one by one. Start yeah. the DAOs. Now, DAOs as a technology is not really a technology. DAOs is just a, a front end, very simple front end to enable people to come in together and organize themselves. That is a human thing, not a technology thing. Now, if a humans can manage to do this, and we know all the problems associated to democracy and regulation, bureaucracy, slowness, corruption, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, just putting Putting people on a blockchain and a smart contract does not alleviate these issues. Let's take a very simple example. We want to vote as a DAO on a proposal. The proposal is to buy, let's say most DAOs, like a famous DAO is now Merit Circle. The proposal is to buy a gaming studio. So they can buy more games or they can launch more games. Now, first of all, you have to document the, the whole process very well. Then everybody has to read the process. Then everybody has to agree on the process. Then there is space where you can like leave things open because you're still in control of the funds, right? There's always going to be somebody who has to act on these things. Otherwise, it's purely on-chain behavior, like I said before, like the DAO maximalism. That's not what most DAOs are. DAOs are mostly a place where people can get together and trust one person to do the right thing. So again, very slow. He needs the person in charge who needs to write a lot of proposals. They need to read a lot of proposals and this by itself can be counterproductive compared to a centralized organization, especially in the startup phase when it's just moving fast. I believe that the main benefits of a DAO come only into play once a company is as big as Twitter, right? So the, it's very unclear right now where they go to as a structure. We are finally seeing some prog progressions as DAOs, but first people have to learn from all the failures Instead of just learning from the real governments, you know, politicians, they want to learn and fail themselves. So I still think until we see proper structures which can outperform a centralized firm will take five years at least. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening right now until we get to that level. So thank you so much for that part of the answer. So second part, how do you see, and of course, bear in mind that in one end, the technology of blockchain is becoming very mature. We have governments, we have uh, supply chain, most of the biggest technology companies in the world are creating blockchain as a service and so forth, especially for cloud computing and different areas. So I would like to see how do you see the progress of the bridge between, because in the end of the day, your platform is creating tokens and tokenomic solutions through products and through the DAO system. So how do you see this kind of growth and maturity? Because of course, like you said, it started in 2017, 18, there was a first crash, but it kept growing. And from the ICO, we went to IDO, so there's a lot of maturity around the industry. And of course, this is not going to stop. It's just going to grow. But there's probably a lot of phases of growth. Um, blockchain is for most finance. Right? The blockchain is for most Bitcoin. And Bitcoin for most is money. Until blockchain cannot significantly impact the way we do finance as a technology fintech, we will not see other use cases. You know, it's just a bit like, internet was majority emails until most people had an email account we did not see more use cases because they have to build up on things um so until we don't see significant adoption as for crypto as a payment and that's what people think of crypto right they don't think supply chain um com cloud computing is what you said too there's a good use cases there you're an expert when people think of crypto they think money so unless we don't see significant adoption in money, finances, and financial products and instruments, we will not see much progress in other use cases. And I, now the progress on financial instruments and money 
financial instruments okay with DeFi. We see now what 35 billion TVL. It's quite significant, getting interesting for banks. In terms of payments, Bitcoin has a million people with one Bitcoin, 980K. It's not much. So we are now finally seeing some adoption to Bitcoin Lightning. I do believe in the next 24 months, we will see significant adoption of Bitcoin Lightning systems. I, I agree with you. And I think I, I like the way you approach it because it's definitely, I think, between the technology, the innovation, and the ecosystems. And I think, especially, I think your platform and platforms like yours are very important to demystify, first of all, the, the marketplaces and the way you're going to be doing uh, this kind of marketplaces of the future because it's about, in the end of the day, blockchain is a technology and technology is supposed to solve problems and solve very specific things, not to be speculative, crazy stuff. That is about money and the history of money and the evolution. Money has been changing since we are humans. So uh, as one of the last questions, and I'll be respectful of your time to think, stick with one hour. So um, you are launching NFTs. And uh, and for instance, a lot of the things you have in your DAO uh, maker, for instance, if I look at the list of some of the projects that are here in terms of token sales, you have a lot of projects related with metaverse and a lot of gaming and so forth. So how do you see... The second iteration, I would say, the, of the Web 3.0, let's put it that way, the, the metaverse and the NFTs. And now do you want to bring NFTs to the DAO maker? Because I think you, you've you been very careful the way you've been doing this. And, uh, and of yes. course, the NFT industry is still very, it's just one year old. Let's put it from a, I would say, from so, an organized perspective, yeah. I'd like to take some time for the specific question. I think we still have 10 minutes. Now, the interesting thing about NFTs is in 2018, we collaborated very much with one of the biggest NFT companies to date. It was a VV, was funded by the founder of Pokemon. We all know Pokemon. And it's a very su good success case. It went to multi-billion dollar market cap. One of the most downloaded apps in the game. And that was like a NFT, early, early NFT, right? Before the apes came out, was very successful. So we were heavily involved in the success of that and then never touched NFTs again. So we knew very much about NFTs. I personally had a crypto kitty from 2017 still. But the hype of 2021, we carefully stood on the side and watched everything go on. And then we evaluated. We came to the conclusion that the way NFTs are working right now is the same way token sales happened in 2017. Mostly scams, very big raises, and very disorganized. No platforms, everybody has to do everything themselves. Well, so it was very inefficient. Um, and we saw what is NFTs. It's what a lot of people think, like what is an NFT? If no one really understood it, it took a long time for me to really understand the concept. So when I try to look at an invention that gets adoption, I think what is the problem that it's trying to solve? And is this technology innovation solving the problem better than the technology we had before? And once you create this framework, it's easier for you to understand new technologies. Now NFTs solve the problem that clothing solves and bags for the 21st century. The idea of you wanting to showcase your status in the society, in your peer group, to people who see you. Now, most of, since COVID, we, you and me speak on Zoom. We don't see each other. We probably will never see each other, but it doesn't matter anymore. As a society, it became very normal for someone to judge someone over the internet. And therefore we needed a, a technology that replaces clothing online and that is nfts and that was misunderstood for most of 2021 most of 2021 it was just celebrities selling merchandise nfts are not merchandise and that is why a lot of people hate crypto these nfts now now towards the end of 2021 people realized nfts are just a different way of doing fundraising you have an nft you have to write a white paper you have to write utilities to it and then they were like okay that's our domain and we're the pros of fundraising and incubations. So for example, our first NFT collection is very interesting, working very close to them, are fundraising for a, um, a manga, so a Chinese comic book and an anime. And they wrote everything down and you can buy the characters in the manga and then they will give a token. And if the manga gets more adoption after the first season, it maybe can make money. And that goes back to the, found, to the people who founded it. And it's a better way to funding uh, comic books and movies because you own the NFTs of the characters in the movie. So you instantly build a relationship to them. And we said, okay, that is a use case that can get major adoption. And that's when we start moving into the space. 
Well, I, I love what you, you guys, what you say, and I think it's the way to go because we need maturity on this project, but we need as well to have a bit of grown up <laughs> because of course, if we continue just going through, of course the IP is great. Okay, I, I, I'm very, actually very grateful that there's a much uh, hype around these things, but of course, like you said, the, if you see OpenSea with around studies saying that around 70 to 80% of the NFTs are, are fake, that's a big risk. And as well, it creates a lot of uh, potential uh, systemic risks for the community and for the people. And as well, that, that creates a lot of noise for actually the creators. The NFTs were created to empower creators, collectives, and, and a lot of other personalities that want to get solutions for their problems and actually to get funding. And it has to be simplified. And I think it comes back to what you said about the beginning of the internet, that we this is kind of what you're doing is the web 3.0, which is exactly the third stage. And, uh, and I think it's really a key element. So, so let me go right now a bit from the NFTs to the metaverse and the app 3.0 that you touched a couple of times, but we didn't elaborate. And I take your time. I, I'm not uh, uh, contingent in terms of time. It's more from your side. I want to be respectful. But from, from a perspective of app 3.0 and especially the areas of, of uh, metaverse, how do you see this? Because in the end of the day, the blockchain is supposed to be the layer of um, so somehow the layer of supply chain certification for the web 3.0 and a bit like the, the book of uh, Don Tep Scott that in the internet every, you can have a dog searching for you we don't know if it's a dog or if it's someone in this case we want to know that there's a real person there of course with the respect for the privacy and so forth so we'd like to hear your opinions especially with the expertise and as well with the, yes. the technical knowledge that you have building what you're building sure um so we worked with multiple metaverses right at the moment i'm actually working at the moment with um, the meta a metaverse which is founded by the founder of metamask so i'm very interested the way he thinks about it because he understood how technologies will evolve by creating the the doorway to web3 metamask is by far without any question the most adopted block um, wallet decentralized wallet um, so I'm very excited working with this team on the new MetaMask, on the new Meta Metaverse. And I learned a lot from them about how this could play out. No one knows how things will work out in the future. Some people think they know better. Some people don't know. Now, a blockchain is basically just... Now, if you take the blockchain to an immutable thing that cannot be stopped, you need proof of work. It is my kind of conclusion. I don't not a big fan of proof of stake when it comes to the idea that a blockchain is a thing that can never be stopped. That's Bitcoin, right? You, like I said, it's either a thing that solves disputes or a thing that makes sure there will never ever be disputes. Like block the Bitcoin is so clear that there will never be a dispute if I actually send the money here or there, right? Because it's too expensive to fake it. Now, if you think of a blockchain as just a database, as a move of society towards transparent open databases, that's really what it is. It's what people don't understand. This technology is money and Bitcoin and us as a society moving to a open public database. That's it. That's this whole technology. And that's what people need to understand. And we as a society learned the problems of having closed databases, you know, like Facebook man manipulating with algorithms and databases, et cetera. So that's why we need to move to these open databases. Once you have a system where a lot of information is on an open database, you can showcase this visually, this data in a visual manner in an open metaverse. A metaverse is just going to be the visual representation of all the public data on the database. I hope that's not too high for users. No, no, I, I think uh, I, I have a technical question on that. And I, I'm sure for the users asking questions, please ask questions to in the, the chat. I'm sure we will answer. But I think what is important right now for me is, so the the we have actually, there's a fantastic book that is the spider. And I don't know if you heard the, the spider and the starfish that talks about uh, democratized uh, organizations in history of humanity. Or not actually the centralized versus centralized organizations, and the and the book makes a parallel between the the starfish. That is, if you cut the part of the starfish, it duplicates and creates another one. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Was used by the CIA and the FBI to to study the Al Qaeda and a lot of uh, terrorist organizations, and it was actually uh, used as well by Wikipedia and a lot of technology people. But what what is interesting is if you look at the 
the mechanisms of society, they are always looking at centralized organizations. Although we have very successful decentralized solutions in the past from the more Canadians to the Alcoholics Anonymous and a couple of other projects that were fantastic, especially some organizations and societies. But in general, we've been having spider organizations that is like one head. And even me, I, I, I struggle in my own organization to have a team that actually can actually take out of me and lead because leadership is difficult and you are a CEO, so you know what I mean. But I think the point is that how do you see these kind of technologies that are completely perfect for this, but dealing with our humanity and our kind of centralized, centralized systems and how can we create the governance? I think the question is the governance because the code in the end of the day will do whatever we ask them to do. Um, but, but the point is that how can we create the systems? Because it has to be a very strong sense of community, a very strong sense of uh, tribal system as well. Uh, if, if you look at the tribes, they, they work well because there was a sense of tribe and the sense of respect. Which in the common world, like you said, Silicon Valley controls probably 80%. And if I look between Silicon Valley and then uh, Beijing, uh, they control 90% of the internet, most of this. But that's the same point. I think if you look at and a great example is I'm a huge fan of Matt Mulligan and WordPress. WordPress is a completely decentralized platform and uh, it's a foundation that runs it and it's 40, around 37% of the internet. So we have fantastic examples of kind of decentralized systems that work quite well. But I would like to hear your views on this because this, that's for me the biggest challenge that I face as, as a technologist and as well as a leader. Now, decentralized systems are systems that can, like, any technology is just a mirror of human, human psychology. Let's start with that. A decentralized system can only work in a tool in which humans can self-regulate. Let's give an example. Uh, let's take religion. Right, that's a very successful, now you think religion is a centralized system because it's a pope, but that's kind of irrelevant. No one cares about the pope. Religion is a very decentralized system. And it's based on the idea to make humans act in a more moral manner so that we can be more prosperous as a society. That's generally speaking, the objective of every religion. Mass scale influencing humans to act in a manner that is more prosperous to society and their peers. Okay? Decentralized mass scale influencing people to act more prosperous to their peers. That's the sentence. Now, let's take a look at how religion, like say Christianity as a technology, technology is just like an idea, does this. Christianity takes the idea that if you can forgive yourself, so that plugs into your own ability to be remorseful, then whatever you have done, which is immoral, can't be that bad. But if you've done something that is so bad that you cannot forgive yourself, then you have to continuously think about it. You will never do it again, right? Because you're remorseful. Now, the technology of Christianity is to enhance that effect, which is inside of you. If you cannot forgive yourself, then you're going to hell, which is a horrible thing, right? This idea of hell. I hope you're following. So the Christianity as an idea or a technology is purely the, the amplifier of your remorse so that you keep thinking about what you did wrong so you don't do it again. Now, that is decentralized, comes from everybody inside, unless you're a psychopath, then you don't have that remorse feeling, okay? But that's a very rare case. When it comes to crypto and Ethereum or Bitcoin, um, the idea of the idea of decentralization in Bitcoin is purely based on making sure that nobody is corrupt. Like this pure idea of making myself better than everybody else, like using somebody else's wealth to Im Im um, improve my own wealth. And Bitcoin tries to solve this by making sure that that's impossible. So again, it's a similar system. It's hard to decide really. Like you said, it's very, very difficult to identify when do we need a decentralized system? When do we need a centralized system? But the idea is purely this, a decentralized system is only necessary if it's purely deep down rooted with us. So that it can affect every single person by himself. He doesn't need me as a leader to tell him what to do. And we know it ourselves. Yeah, it's, I, I'm listening to you and I think, it's, I think we can go for hours because this becomes philosophical, not technological. But it's, it's a very tricky part and I think probably we'll wrap up with this. Uh, I want to touch a bit more of Dow Maker, but I think it's really, 
just as a note is I, I, I struggle still because as humans look at the wars and, and of course we are in the better stage of development of humanity because if you look at uh, at the 8 billion people that we have right now, the levels of poverty compared in, um, in proportional and mathematics to the rest of the history of humanity, we are much better than ever. Uh, of course, we have other challenges like sustainability and so forth, that sometimes we try to override. And of course, the, the, these platforms that we are using, they tend to highlight the good and the bad. Normally the bad goes more to the top than the good. And the good things like even your platform don't come so much to the good, to the top, uh, unfortunately. So I, I'm, I think it's, it's something that I want to highlight. So, so I think, well, I, I want to thank you. This is amazing. And I have much more questions, but I want to be respectful of your time. So Christophe, to, to finalize, and for people listening to us, um, a bit if you can tell, uh, I don't know, some highlights about what you guys are doing, where people can find, where, especially how do you highlight people to come to DAO Maker? And I actually urge people to research and to be part of that because in the end of the day, the bigger your platform becomes, the more successful, the, the, I think the, the successful of a lot of projects can have a, get more funding, but as well create more. So how can people approach your platform? And of course the website is very easy, but coming from you is always a bit more, uh, more okay. interesting. So it's DAOMaker.com. Be careful. We have so many phishing websites. It's incredible. Like scammers trying to use to make people connect to their MetaMask so they can steal their money. Be very careful, but generally speaking, we have good SEO. So DAOMaker.com, DAO.MAKA.com. Um, and that's the website. Do not trust anybody else. You're going to lose all your money. <laughs> that's, that's a very, very one. important disclaimer. Um, how do we grow as a user base? Now, our last sale, like we have, we are sensational. We grow through publicity stunts. And our last sale, which was Step Up, um, we did $3.7 million raise to 8,000 people. People got around 200 to $300 allocations in that project. That project went to 200X. So people, some people turned $5,000 into $100,000. And they tell their friends, right? This is a rare case. I'm not gonna say this is a, this is a very rare outlying case, but it comes maybe once or twice a year. And this is how a lot of people hear about it from us. Now, this is not like anybody can win. First of all, it's a lottery, but more importantly, we don't want, you know, these companies are successful because they're as good as their holders. I used to, I, in 2018, I wrote a paper, a cryptocurrency is only as valuable as the collective knowledge and usefulness as their holders. And based on this thesis, this is what we are, we are building our company. We try to make sure that the holders of this community, of this token, of this DAO, whatever, is as useful as possible. So just if you want to come and get free money, that's not the right place. We're trying to make a place where we connect quality people with quality startups. First of all, congratulations. And, uh, and I think it's really impressive, uh, $4 billion being raised and what you just raised recently as well. And I think people, uh, well, it's not 4 I billion. Think... I want to make sure I, I said the total, what we raised, yeah, the market caps of that is now 4 billion. Yes. And I understand it's the ecosystem that we've been it's part it's of. It's... Okay. It's, it's, I understand completely, but it's important for people to listen that we're talking about yes. a very strong ecosystem. That is a multi-billion dollars ecosystem that of course is, is an amplification ecosystem. And I think especially for crowdfunding right. platforms and, and platforms like yours are key. So uh, I want to thank you, Christoph. It's been a fantastic journey. The hour passed actually very fast. Um, there's definitely more questions and probably I'll come back to you to do a live with a couple of people discussing centralized versus decentralized and challenge how to make it happen because I am the first one but uh, the governance is always my main headache <laughs> and I've been actually in, in all the projects I've been as well within crypto I always had challenge within my own board so so I know that is not so easy and I'm sure that everyone that has a company has to go through some kind of challenge on this you don't need to go through technology or to whatever so it's about common sense but as well leadership so congratulations first of all thank you so much and I hope that will be the first of a lot of other interactions thank you so much thank you for having me on your platform and podcast to be able to talk today Cheers. have a nice day thank you so much